He's sweet, I know. After a lesson, our last selection as we stand, 403, no tears in heaven. 403. No tears in heaven, there'll be no sorrow. Oh, we'll be in glory in that land. There'll be no sadness. All will be gladness. When we shall join that happy band and there'll be no tears yes there'll be no tears sorrow and pain will all have flown there'll be no tears there'll be no tears no tears in heaven will be known glory is waiting waiting up yonder where we shall spend an endless day thou with our savior will be forever well no more no sorrow can dismay, and thou be no tears. Thou be no tears. Sorrow and pain will all have flown. Thou be no tears. Thou be no tears. No tears in heaven will be known. Some morning yonder will cease to ponder over things this life has brought to view. All will be clearer, save one be dearer. In heaven, where all will be made new, and there'll be no tears. There'll be no tears. Sorrow and pain will all have flown. There'll be no tears. There'll be no tears, no tears in heaven will be known, and there'll be no tears, there'll be no tears, sorrow and pain will all have flown. There'll be no tears. Heavens. There'll be no tears. No tears in heaven will be known. Amen. Thank God for Jesus Christ and the author and the finisher of our faith. Thank God for Jesus Christ. Are you happy to be in the house of the Lord this morning? I'm certainly excited, not only for the gift of life and being in my right mind, but also being among the people of God who love to praise his name. Amen. We are certainly getting excited for our vacation Bible school uh, that's coming up uh, starting on uh, next Sunday. Uh, we are really excited about that. We want to continue to encourage you to go to our website and register online uh, so that we can have a record of your attendance and uh, we want you to get your friends and your neighbors and your loved ones to register uh, so that we can uh, know who's uh, going to be coming next week. We're excited. We have some special things lined up for our young people, uh, and we're just going to have a good time in the Lord. It's a wonderful opportunity to you, for you to invite those who may not uh, be a member of our fellowship. Uh, Vacation Bible School is a little less intimidating. Uh, it's not as intimidating as asking someone to come to Bible class or to worship. Uh, so it's a wonderful opportunity for you to uh, share the gospel with uh, someone who may not know the Lord. Uh, we are partnering this year in our community outreach uh, project. We, 
uh, with the uh, New Image Emergency Shelter, which is located on 38th Street and was founded over 25 years ago by a set of twin sisters. Uh, they started with a very, very small complex and now it has grown to be one of the largest homeless shelters in the city. Uh, they take in uh, nightly three to three, 300 to 350 men, uh, 200 to 250 women nightly. Uh, they help them to shower. They give them a hot meal in the evening and uh, where we come in is they also offer them uh, underwear, uh, fresh underwear. Uh, you have to be careful what you take for granted. Uh, you and I don't think anything about going home, taking a shower and putting on fresh underwear, but there's some people who cannot afford to take that for granted. And where we come in is we're going to ask that you be very generous as we have been in years past with our other community projects. And we're going to see if Crenshaw can bless uh, that uh, homeless shelter. I think we can come up with at least 2,000 pair of underwear. Don't y'all think so? I think we got, I'm, I'm like Pop Hogan would say, I'm looking out over the audience. And I see 2,000 pair. Uh, they only... They're not accepting uh, undershirts. They're not accepting, I don't call them wife beaters. I call them wife blessers because I don't beat my wife. I bless my wife. Uh, amen. And, and I wear A shirts. That's what they're called. But they're not accepting A shirts. We're not looking for that. We're looking for underwear. Women, we're looking for panties. And I said it. I didn't want to say it last week. But the committee got on me for trying to be politically correct. They said, just say it. We're looking for undergarment sizes, um, medium through, uh, I believe it's, uh, is it large or extra large? It's large, I believe, uh, for both men and women. Uh, please, uh, brand new, uh, I, don't, I shouldn't have to say that, but brand new, still in its original packaging. Uh, we would greatly appreciate that. Um, can you stand to your feet and uh, go greet somebody and tell them good morning? I hope we get full participation, even those in the back. As I journey through this land, singing as I go, and pointing so to Calvary, to the crimson flow, and many arrows pierce my soul from without within, but my Lord leads me on in the room. Him I must win, we keep singing, oh, I want to see him blow upon his friend, and then to sing forever, ah, his saving grace, 
face of all the stream of glory. Let me let my voice, cause you know the kiss of I'll be home at last and it the to rejoice and win in service for my Lord. Dark may be the night, but I'll cling more close to him. He will give me light and certain snare may fix my soul and turn my thoughts aside but my lord goes ahead and leave what it be we keep seeing it all to see him look upon his face and let to see forever how his saving way of a home the street of the Lord let me let my voice cause you know that kills I'll be home at last and ever to reach all now when before me be no rise from the mighty day. Then my Lord directs my boy. He does say, Ricky, and he leads me gently on through this world below. And he's a real friend to me and know I love him so and we sing to see him love upon his face and let to see forever how his saving way of a home the street of glory let me let my voice cause you know the kiss of I'll be home at last and ever to me we keep singing oh I want to see him home upon his face and let to see Forever, I'll be saving the way of a home. And I have her to rejoice. Lionel, uh, you young preachers out here, don't try this at home. <laughs> I am a trained professional. Uh, for you detractors out there uh, who are looking at me like, what's this Negro going to do? You may not remember much about this message, but you will get my point. Uh, the pioneer preacher G.E. Stewart preached mighty sermons and could not see a lick. I think I can get through 25 minutes of discourse on this Sunday. Uh, before you take offense for Brother Ed Burke, I called him this week. That's right, Brother Burke is legally blind faithful man of God who comes every Sunday and I got his blessing to do this so before you go sticking up for him in front of me just know that when I called him this week he said preach the word and do it the Bible says in Genesis 19 
Um, we're going to take a very small snippet of our story. We're going to begin at verse number 10, and we're going to go through verse number 11. Uh, now, I will warn you, if you are a walker and you plan to walk to the bathroom and come this way, uh, I can't see you. So I, I may not try to hit you, but you might get hit if you walk this way. So I suggest if you plan on walking, go towards the back. The Bible says in Genesis 19 and verse number 10, but the men, speaking of the two angels, pulled Lot back into the house. Your Bible says something like that. And, and the Bible says, and they did what? Shut the door behind him. And I, at this point now, Lot is now back in the house after reasoning with the men of the city. And the Bible says, and they pulled him through the doorway. Uh, and in doing so, they struck the men with what? Blindness who were at the doorway. The Bible says they struck the men both great and small. And then the last clause in the sentence in verse number 11 says, speaking of the men of Sodom, and they grew weary trying to find. Y'all see that? Now, I'm going to make some mistakes up here. That's my point. Because I sure enough can't see. But I want you to watch this. <clears throat> there are some people who are so caught up in what they're doing that they cannot see what God is doing in their lives. Lot is at a very interesting predicament in the story. He has gone outside to try, the Bible says, to reason with the men who want to come in and take sexual advantage of these two divine strangers. He goes out and calls them brethren and says, please do not do this wicked thing. But the Bible says that the men pressed upon Lot, that they were pushing him over, trying to get into the house. And our text picks up and says, the visitors on the inside reach out and pull Lot back into the house. It's interesting that Lot finds himself reasoning with people who can't be reasoned with. Anybody ever had a discussion with somebody and you're trying to talk some common sense uh, and you realize they just not going to get it. As a matter of fact, they don't even want to get it. Matter of fact, they have believed the lie so long and, and made it sound so good that their stupidity sounds smart. It sounds logical. It sounds like it's the right thing to do. And you try to tell them. You bring somebody else in to tell them. You try to sit down and show them in the book. You try to get them to realize 2 plus 2 equals 4. 4 plus 4 equals 8. But for whatever reason, they just don't get it. What happens in the world of religion when you try to share with people that Jesus Christ is the way? And for whatever reason, they don't want to hear what you have to say, what the Bible has to say, what the preacher has to say, what anybody else has to say. They have made up their mind. Spiritual blindness is a human problem. We suffer with it because we are so used to seeing with our eyes that our heart, our spirit, and our soul basically goes malnourished. Scriptures teach us that blindness is not only a physical problem, but it's also a spiritual problem. The scriptures teach us that blindness uh, in the physical realm is governed by God. 
Uh, Y'all remember when old Moses uh, stood before God and he was trying to uh, tell God why he could not go to Egypt. Y'all remember the story? Uh, and tell Pharaoh uh, uh, on behalf of God to let my people go. Y'all remember that? Uh, and, and he started giving God excuses as to why he couldn't go. Y'all remember that? The Bible says that he tells God, uh, uh, I have a stuttering problem or a speech impediment. I'm not good in my speech. Y'all remember the story? Uh, and and I don't think I can do what you're asking me to do. And God said in Exodus chapter 4 and verse number 11, Who made your tongue? Who made the dumb, the deaf, and the blind? Is it not I? Amen, somebody. Y'all remember the scripture in John chapter 9, beginning at verse number 2. The disciples rolled up on a blind man. The Bible says was blind since birth. And they asked Jesus, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? And Jesus said, neither this man nor his parents. The man was born blind so that the works of God might be made manifest in him. Some people have blind eyes just so God can show you how good he is. Some of us had hardened hearts, but God massaged our heart. He's the best cardiologist I've ever met. And the Bible says that he is able to transform us through the renewing of our minds. It's interesting now, it's interesting that, that in the ancient Near East how they thought about blind people. First of all, if you're blind, obviously you can't work. So most blind folks were beggars. Typically in the New Testament, you see Jesus crossing paths with beggars who are blind. They can't work. As a matter of fact, they are totally dependent on somebody else. They try to make it, but guess what? They can't see. And so they're always reaching. And I mean, if I hit somebody, I'm sorry now, brother. You just take, I don't, I don't know who I'm talking to here, so y'all got to help me out. Uh, they're, they're always reaching and, and trying to find their way. And so blind people were looked at with disdain because they could not do for themselves. Obviously, there was a theological connotation that went along with blindness. That if you were born blind, God must be taking something out on you. That's the reason why the disciples told Jesus that in John 9. Because obviously this man must have done something wrong. His parents must have done something wrong for him to be born that way. Uh, so theologically they thought that God must have zapped him with blindness because of his sin. Uh, and so there was this understanding that people, people who are blind uh, must have done something wrong. Well... Blind people, not only could they not work and most of them had to beg, but some of them, some of them had ultimately uh, uh, an understanding wrapped on them that said they were less than. The term blind, especially the Greek term uh, typhlu, uh, means uh, uh, to have no access to light. It means that things are concealed from you. Therefore, people who were born blind were always a day late and a dollar short because they could not see for themselves. So in the scriptures, we always see that blindness is, is something that you don't want to have. It's something that is looked down on. It's derogatory. But for our intents and purposes for this message, what about those of us who suffer with spiritual blindness. We got two good eyes, but can't see. We, 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 we have eyes to see, but cannot perceive. It's interesting that the scriptures show us that sometimes blindness is brought on because of hardness of heart. Sometimes it's due to rejection of the truth. Other times it is due because a person simply cannot trust in the word of God. Sometimes 
Blindness is a deterioration of your pupils. Meaning you start off with the ability to see. But over time, your eyesight starts to leave you. Other people, other people are born that way. They never saw. Then there's some people, my friends, who go through some horrific accident and all of a sudden they cannot see. Well, the same thing happens with spiritual blindness. There's some folk based on what family they're born in. Uh, based on who their folks are, based on where they went to school and how they were raised, uh, they, they, they never, ever were able to see the truth. There's some people who saw the truth, but for whatever reason, have backslid their way from the light. And slowly but surely, they've taken on uh, blind man tendencies, and they became dependent on the world instead of the word of God. And they look up, and they're so far away gone from the light, namely Jesus Christ, that everything around them is dark. But then there are some people who go through horrific adversity, and they walk away from God. How could God take my son? How could God take my husband? How could God put me in this predicament? How could God make me have to go through this? And because of some accident in their life, because of some hardship in their life, all of a sudden they can't see. So here's three things I want to leave with you this morning. The first is the striking. The second is the separation. And the last thing I'll end with is the spent. Y'all got that? The, the striking, the separation, and the spent. Why are people spiritually blind? Why can they not see what it is God wants them to do? My friends, sometimes... Blindness is an effect from disobedience. Can I show you that in the scripture? I'm going to need Brother L. Page to read for me because obviously I can't do it for myself. Can y'all go over to Deuteronomy chapter 28, verse number 28? The Bible says God in giving the second law, uh, he's taking Moses through the law again. Uh, in chapter 28, he is describing uh, what it means to uh, obey the law, but then he's talking about the effects, the effects of disobeying the law. You realize uh, for every action, there is a reaction. And when you stand rebellious against God, when you do everything contrary to the word of God, that there is a reaction that comes back on you. Don't think that you can just do things and there are no consequences and repercussions you can do that if you want to but somewhere down the line is going to catch up with you i believe as paul said uh that uh, a man reaps uh, uh whatever he sows and, and 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 guess what whatever you sow you're going to end up reaping one day deuteronomy 28 verse number 28 book says what the lord just might be and the lord just might be come on with madness yes sir with blindness the lord will strike you with madness and with blindness keep reading and the what now? An astonishment of heart. What happened to your mic? Keep reading. That's all right. They'll fix it in the back. Come on, keep reading. And thou shalt grope at noonday. Now watch this. Watch this now. God, if you keep on keeping on, God will lead you to your own devices. And guess what? Over time, uh, you're going to have to reap what you sow. You'll be struck with blindness. You won't understand. The Bible says you will grope at noonday. Now, grope is what I'm doing here. See, I'm walking, but I'm reaching. I know that's Sister Glaze right there because she sit there every Sunday, right? All right. But I'm groping. I'm looking. I'm, and guess what? I have no reason to grope as long as the light's on. The scriptures say it's noonday. You grope at night when ain't no lights in the house, and you're looking for the coffee table so you don't slam your knee up against it, right? You, if you're like me, you're looking for the bed post because you don't want to break one of your toes trying to get to the bathroom at 2.30 in the morning. So you grope because you don't want to hurt yourself. Uh, the Bible says uh, if you keep on keeping on it's gonna be light outside and you still won't have the ability to see 
Y'all see that? Now, when it comes to spiritual blindness, you must understand that you might just be there, not because you decided to turn the lights off, but maybe God left you to your own devices, and in the process, he turned the lights off on you. Now, now can we just be honest? Uh, you miss worshiping and you can miss Sunday school and Bible class if you want to. Uh, you cannot uh, 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 get yourself in God's word if you want to. But there are consequences and repercussions for not knowing the word of God. Because the moment you find yourself in a pinch and you go looking for strength from God's word, you can't call the church and say, Brother Curl, where is that passage? Brother Tyson, I can't seem to find it. You need to hide the word of God in your heart. David said so I might not sin against thee. Isaiah 44, let's start at verse number 17. God can put something on you so where you can't see, you, you're going to have trouble trying to figure out how to discern. Why? Because he leads you to your own devices. The Bible says in Isaiah chapter 44 and verse number 17, book says what? Come on, keep reading. Watch this now. You're basically, uh, Isaiah is in the middle of talking about them worshiping uh, false gods. And, and he says, now you're going out there burning all the incense and doing what you want, and the residue from it, and you the, make that your God. Keep reading. Keep reading. And the residue. And the residue from those burnt we'll offerings. You we'll make, make that it, your God. Keep reading. We'll make it a God. Yes, sir. Come on. Even in the graven image. Watch this now. You go out. And you start to worship, you start to worship graven images, things, the created. Instead of the creator, you put more emphasis on stuff. You put more emphasis on what you can see, what you can taste, what you can smell. Instead of worshiping God by faith. Keep reading. And he falleth down unto it. And you fall down unto it and you worship it. Come on, up here, keep reading. And, and praying. And you pray to it. And what else? And what else? Said, deliver me. And you ask those oh things to deliver you. Now, I want you to watch this. Your money can't deliver you. Your education can't deliver you. Don't y'all realize this PhD is out of work? You can go to school to your 102. That don't guarantee you no job. Amen, somebody. I ask these master's degree folk what it's like trying to find a job. It's hard out there. Amen. You can't even get a job at McDonald's. They'll tell you you overqualified. How's somebody overqualified to clean the toilet? I got arms. I got some Ajax and some pine saw. Just because I got a degree, that don't mean I can't clean the commode. Amen. You overqualified. You better understand your car, your savings account, your, your, your identity, uh, your title. Uh, you better not worship that because it can't save you in that day. Keep reading, LP. They say they have not known. They have not known what? No understand. They don't have no understanding. For he has shut their eyes. Because God has shut their eyes. Their eyes. Now, in the New Testament, Jesus deals with the Pharisees. And the Pharisees, my friends, are the spiritually blinded. But I want you to watch this now. They are the people in Scripture who walk around like they're enlightened. Yes. Oh, this is about to get quiet up in here now. Uh, you know why it's about to get quiet? Because some of us walk around thinking we know more Bible than most people then forgot, amen, and, and we can't be told nothing, and we think because uh, we went to this congregation or was discipled by this person or went to this school that that gives us a monopoly on the scripture and spirituality, and just like the Pharisees, we look down our nose, majoring in the minors, minoring in the majors, and guess what? We still have haven't served the Lord because we think we know it all. Jesus said uh, in Matthew chapter 15, uh, beginning uh, uh, around about verse number 14, that the Pharisees who were offended when Jesus talked to them about their worship practices, uh, the Bible says Jesus called them blind guides of the blind. Blind guides of the blind? That don't make no sense. Blind leading. Y'all going to have to help me with this. Now, if I ask you to help me get to the restroom, I need somebody that can see and know the way to the restroom to help me. 
Now I was talking to Brother Burke, and uh, he said in the blind community, they don't use the term blind lead the blind. He said in the blind community, they use the term blind lead the fool. I said, why so, Brother Burke? He said, because you got to be a fool if you're blind, and you're going to follow somebody who's blind. Now, you don't know where you're going, but you're going to line up behind somebody who also don't know where they're going. Baptizing don't mean no harm, uh, but if you want a good marriage, you need to follow somebody with a good marriage. You don't need to be asking somebody been divorced three times. Amen, Walls. You want to lose weight, you want to go to somebody that lost some weight. Y'all not hearing me? Y'all not hearing me? I, I said, Brother Davis, I told you class a couple weeks ago, and we were talking about this, and I said, listen, listen, listen. Uh, I want somebody to be my personal trainer that didn't lost 300 pounds. You know, these, these, I'm, there ain't no knock against y'all who in shape and been in shape your whole life, but see, you don't understand working out from a fat man's perspective. <laughs> see, I want somebody who know what it's like when the church's chicken be calling you. And you got to yield not to temptation. See, if you ain't never had to taste a church's chicken, then you don't understand what I'm going through. So I don't mind you train on somebody that's been there, done that. You be careful who you follow. You don't want to be a blind, uh, you don't want to be a fool being led by a blind person. Now, you know the problem with it is? Some of us miss the warning signs God has put right in front of us. Story goes about the captain of the Titanic. Long before the Titanic ran into the ice glacier, that his, that his, uh, his mates told him, uh, Sir, I think we have a problem. But he didn't want to hear it. And they kept on sailing. Y'all seen the movie. And before long, they didn't bumped into, well, they really bumped into, didn't they? The glacier. And he still thought they was okay. Could have called for help, but didn't. It wasn't until he went downstairs into the mail room and realized that the ship was taking on water. Then he called for help, but by the end, the ship had started to sink. Some of us are taking on water. God has warned us that walking this way is going to get us in trouble, but we don't want to stop at the stop sign and then we cry for help and it's too little. Y'all going to help me preach this? So, the story of a horrific accident that happened November 30th, 1991 on the 5 freeway. About 150 miles outside of Oakland is a small city called Colinga. Uh, it's known because that's right around the place where the cows. And if you ever drive up the driven up the five going to the bay, uh, you start to smell Colinga before you get there. <laughs> Y'all know something about that? Uh, 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 and, 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 and it was early on November the 30th, 1991, when a windstorm went through Colinga and it pulled up all the dust off of the ground and it swirled around the freeway and then all of a sudden there was an accident on the freeway and and because the wind was whipping and because the dust was swirling the drivers could not see and one by one they plowed into one another because they was not able to see what was going on there are many people in this room that are part of that accident and instead of you saying, I need to slow my roll and maybe get off this path, you will follow them right into the same accident they're in. That's the reason why when people stand up and say, I'm a recovering addict, you ought to listen. That's the reason why people stand up and say, God brought me through divorce and I was the problem, you ought to listen. When people stand up and say, I was a no good two bit so and so, you ought to listen because that, that is your warning so you won't go down that path. The second thing, I'm, I don't even know what time it is. Y'all going to be in trouble. Um, <laughs> maybe I ought to worship with blind folks. <laughs> Praise God. Uh, uh, um, uh, the second thing I want to share with you are, uh, we talked about God striking, but then there's a separation. Notice, notice, Lot is trying to reason with them. They blow right through his reasoning. 
The Bible says they pushed or pressed up on him. And the Bible says that, 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 that the men pulled him back in. Y'all see that? Into the house. I thank God for separation. I'm going to be honest with you. If it was up to Lot, he'd still be out there trying to reason. But it wasn't up to Lot. As a matter of fact, uh, in a couple of weeks when we get deeper into the text, it, when it's time to get out of Dodge City, Lot moving slow. To the point where the, where the men got to grab him by the arm and pull him out of town. Y'all ever heard that song by Frank Sinatra, I Left My Heart? Is that Dean Martin or Frank Sinatra? Was you ever one of the Red Pack, Left My Heart in San Francisco? See, see it's Tony Bennett, excuse me, brother. I, 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 I don't know my casino music. Thank you very much. Tony Bennett left his heart in San Francisco. Sorry about that. Uh, get my facts straight. And, 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 and his heart was still inside him. And, 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 and God had to separate him from those men. I want you to watch this. Those of us who can see, don't think you did that on your own ability. See, don't go looking down your nose because you see the light and you follow Jesus like you're better than everybody else. Because there's still some areas in your life God got to snatch you from. Because you wouldn't go on your own accord. See, there's some things God just got to take from me. Amen. Hallelujah, somebody. There's some things I want for myself God know better, and he will not allow me. And sometimes when I'm going that way, he have to, he have to shut down my car so I can't get there. Oh, y'all don't know nothing about that? I'm on my way to do wrong in the phone ring. Amen. Uh, and it's somebody who want to talk about the Lord. God saving me from myself. Praise God. Y'all need to say amen when you can. Brethren, you know what, what it's like. That's the reason why That's the reason why I go to bed same time as my wife. You know why? Because I don't need to be on the computer late at night. Amen when you can. Amen when you can. Ain't nothing nice on the computer late. When I get emails from people at 1 o'clock in the morning, something wrong with that. And I know you might be a night owl. Amen. Amen. But I ain't getting on no computer. Amen. At 2 o'clock in the morning. When everybody else in the house sleep. Oh, y'all missed that. It got quiet. Look at that. What happened? What happened to my amen? What happened to that? Did you? All the brothers put their head down. Am I right about it? I can't see you. God will snatch you. I think about what the scriptures say. The scriptures say in 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse number 9 that God delivered us from darkness and put us into his marvelous light. If it was up to us, we'd still be following darkness. If it was up to us, we'd still be walking, as Paul said, in the futility of our mind. We'd still be walking around blind. But God saved me from myself. Now, the problem with us uh, Christians is that some of us have certain degrees of sight. Hmm. Preacher, what you mean? Well, there's some people who short-sighted. Can I show you that in the scripture? Come on, uh, L. Page. Where is it at? Uh, is it 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 5? Is that, is that where we need to start? Uh, I, I believe it's 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 5 through 9 is what we're going to read. L. Page, you got it? 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 5. Is that it? Mm -hmm. Go ahead. 2 Peter? Yes, sir. Chapter 1, verse 5. Book says what? And beside this. And beside this. Give all diligence. Give all diligence. Add to your faith. Watch this now. Add. To your faith. Now, here's the list. What are we going to add to our faith? You say virtue. Virtue. Once you have faith, you got to add some virtue. Once we get virtue, what? And to virtue, knowledge. After virtue, add some knowledge. Then what? And to knowledge, temperance. After you understand a little bit, now you got to change your disposition and your attitude. Get some temperance. Then what? And to temperance, patience. Now you got, well, uh oh, now we got to be patient with each other. Lord, have mercy. I'll take the virtue. I'll take the knowledge. I'll take the temperance. But you mean I got to put up with her? Amen. I got to put up with him? Amen. Add to it patience. Then what? And to patience, godliness. Watch this now. Add to patience, godliness. Then what? And to godliness, brotherly kindness. And to godliness, brotherly kindness. And to brotherly kindness, we're going to add some charity or love, right? Yes. Keep reading, Neil, please. And to brotherly kindness. Love. Kindness. Come on. 
And for these things, and for these things, be in you. If they're in you, and abide, and they abound, and make you, and make you what? You shall never be barren. Watch this. You shall never be barren. No unfruitful. Unfruitful. In the knowledge. In the knowledge of our Lord Jesus. Christ. Of our Lord Jesus Christ. Can you read? But he that lacks these things. But he that lacks these things is blind. Is blind. Now, 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 now. I love King James Version. But I love the other versions in this part right around up in here. Because it says you are short sighted. See, see, you, you can see, you just can't see well. Now, can I show you something about being short sighted? When you're a child of God and you're short sighted, it don't mean that you don't recognize the truth. It just means that you pay attention to the wrong thing. Story. Of a young boy whose father took him to his first baseball game when he was about six years old. Took him to a baseball game. Had World Series tickets. October 8th, 1956. Boy was an avid Dodger fan. He loved the Dodgers. Boy, he, Brooklyn Dodgers was his team. Went to the game. He was all excited to see the best players in the world play in the World Series. And lo and behold, all the Dodgers got up, got out. Do you know it not, was not one base runner the whole day? Little boy grew up all he could remember was the fact that he went and saw his favorite team play in the World Series and nobody got a hit and nobody got on base. One day he was telling a story to a person who was a baseball enthusiast. He says, man, I went to my uh, uh, first World Series game when I was six years old and my favorite team, the Brooklyn Dodgers, was playing the New York Yankees and I can't believe not anybody got on base. And the man said, well, what day was it again? He said, well, it was October the 8th, 1956. He said, you went? To the game where the pitcher for the Yankees, Don Lawson, threw a perfect game, no hitter. Little boy looked and said, huh? He said, yeah, the guy who was pitching for the other team threw a perfect game, no hitter. That means nobody got on base and nobody got a hit. He said, well, preacher, what's your point? Sometimes we focus on what we don't get and we miss the bigger picture of what God has allowed us to enjoy. I'm not going to be mad that my kid is not on honor roll. I'm going to be happy that he come home at night in one piece. I'm not going to be upset that my wife don't look like the next man wife. I'm going to be thankful for what I got. She loves me for me, and that's better than Beyonce, Holly Berry, Serena Williams, and everybody else rolled in the one. You focusing on your team not getting no hit, you ought to be praising God that he allowed you to see a perfect game. <laughs> see, we short-sighted. That's why we always walk around comparing ourselves to the next man. Brother so-and-so got one, I want one too. See, so-and-so got one, I want one of them too. You ought to be thankful for what you got. Short-sighted. Not only that, some of us struggle. Well, I'm done, LP. Some of us struggle. Some of us struggle because we don't see the blessing God got for us. I remember when I was in junior high school, Willard Junior High School in Berkeley, California. I remember this. There was an interesting, there was a, a playground, and on the playground, it was right below where the classrooms met. And you could come out of the classroom and be out on, the, on, 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 a, on a balcony, and, and there would be people, kids playing down on the playground. And there was a cruel trick, and Brother Tyson admit I wasn't always acting like I was saved. And uh, uh, people would be playing down on the playground, and we had a problem there. Berkeley is near the water. We had a problem with seagulls. Oh, I think y'all know where I'm going with this. Uh, and at lunchtime, you could take a piece of sandwich, Claude, or you could take a piece of bread, or you could take a donut, and, and if you was on the balcony and you wanted to be mean, you would throw it at the feet of somebody who's playing down on the playground. And y'all know what would happen? Them seagulls that was lined up on the roof, they would jump off that roof and they would swoop down on that food. I told you I wasn't always acting like I was saying. <laughs> so if there was somebody you really didn't like, and you know in junior high school there's a lot of people you don't like, you just sacrifice your lunch and throw half your sandwich down on the playground and, and all the birds would, would come down onto the playground and, and, and they would fight over the morsel of food. And I remember, I recall one day I had a donut. Okay, there was a donut that was thrown. And, 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 and full donut that was thrown. And, and, and the birds 
flew down and they started fighting over it. And one seagull got a piece and three other seagulls started fighting him for the piece. And I mean, they flew and they was just going at it and going at it over this just little piece and, and fighting for crumbs. It was just a, just a, just a morsel fighting for crumbs. And, and, and I remember thinking, well, why don't they just look back down on the ground? There's a whole donut down there. You say, well, preacher, what's your point? Well, some of us are fighting for the spiritual crumbs and the, and, and, and the blessings that are crumbs. Instead of just looking at the entire thing God has given us, we'll fight somebody else for their blessing instead of opening up our understanding and seeing we got it better if we stop competing with them and just go back down on the ground and get the whole donut. Tell folk all the time, I don't want to trade places with nobody. I take what I got. I don't, I don't want your place. You have your place. You have your, I, I take what I have. Mm -mm, mm -mm. I, I don't want your stuff. I take my stuff. I take my weight. I take my size. I take my shoe size. I take my skin color. I take my nappy hair. I take my gray hair. I take my bald in head. I take, I'll take what it, I take it, Lord. I take it. I don't want the so-and-so stuff. I want Tyson stuff. I want the stuff God got in store for me. See, I won't focus on what God has given me because I'm so focused on what you have and don't have. I think I'm about out of time. Can, 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 can I show you the spent? The Bible says that the men outside began to grope for the door. They're looking for it, right? The Bible says they grew weary. That interesting word in Hebrew, weary, means to endeavor in vain. It means they're doing something that at the end of the day, they're not going to get nothing for doing it. So they're wasting their time. Uh, and, and as a matter of fact, when you do that, the Hebrew understanding is that you begin to grieve. You have grief because you didn't spend all this time doing something and you still didn't get nothing for it. So it's like a waste of time. And, and, and basically, they're just wasting their time. They're, they're trying to get something God does not want for them to have. They're trying to get something they don't need, but they're going to waste their energy and spend their entire energy trying to get something God don't want for them anyway. They're going to spend themselves trying to get to that door. And they're never going to find that door. Brothers and sisters, what I'm asking you to do is I want you to think about, to think about how you're carrying yourself. I want you to think about, think about how you're walking in the Lord. First of all, I want you to think about whether or not you are. If you don't know Jesus in the pardon of your sin, you, 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 you need to get in him. That's the first thing. But if you are in him, you got to ask yourself a question. Am I growing? Am I growing? Because I'm going to be honest with you. There's only two positions in the Lord, growing or dying. There is no middle ground. Jesus don't believe in maintaining, y'all. You're either growing or you're dying. In the Lord, that's it. There's only two directions. Either you're growing or you're dying. So for the people who feel like, well, I haven't grown in a long time, or I haven't been challenged in a long time, don't worry about it. We know you're not growing. You're dying, though. If you're still stuck on that same stuff you were stuck on five years ago, you ain't growing. You ain't got to worry about it. I answered for you. You ain't growing. You're dying. If you're still mad at the same thing you was mad at six months ago, you ain't growing. Don't worry about it. I, I answered the question for you. Don't, you ain't even got to ask me. I serve it. You ain't growing. But you're not maintaining either because there's no such thing as maintaining. Not when it comes to spiritual growth. Either you're growing or you're dying. And the question happens that we have to answer this morning is, am I groping after something? Am I going after something that God wants for me? Or is it something I want for myself? You need to ask yourself that question. Because there might be a reason why you haven't got it yet. And the reason might be is that you're never going to get it. Because God not going to let you have it. See, see maybe, maybe you, are, you are groping after something and you think it's what you're supposed to be doing. But because there's no fruit from it, something ought to be telling you. Amen. 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 We have to orientate ourselves to the light. Let me end this thing by the saying this. 
in Christ, when he is illuminated in our life, he sheds lights on things and shows it to us in a new way. There's a story of a man named Bob, Bob Edens. Did my research this week, found this story online. Bob Edens was one of the successful patients of a cornea transplant. Not too many people have actually had them. It may even still be sort of an urban legend, a myth. But the story goes, if I can give you a preacher story, that after 51 years, all of a sudden he was able to see. 51 years he was able to see. And, and they talked to him about, well, what is the experience like? And he says, man, the colors are just so vibrant. He says, yellow, there's nothing like yellow. I cannot describe yellow. He said, yellow is just so yellow. I just love yellow, but my favorite color is red. I love to see red. And, and the most amazing sight I saw was when I saw an airplane fly through the sky and a vapor trail follow it. Let me tell you something. When you allow Christ to start to illuminate in your life, the simple things in life become great big things. See, other folk take it for granted, but when, when Jesus is the head of your life, you will see your children say, oh my God, they look just like me. My good Isaiah chew just like his daddy. My goodness. He lazy like a daddy too. It, 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 it just, I can't believe it. My family's together. You know my mama's still alive. Thank God. Man, I still got my mama. I'm happy. See, the little things folk take for granted, when Jesus is in your life, they become a big thing. I just thank God for my friends that surround me and who love me for me and don't make me be preacher 24-7. They realize I'm a man. I get tired. I get sick and tired of folk, and they allow me to be myself. I thank God for that. See, the little stuff, when Christ is in your life, becomes big. Last thing, and I'm going to take my seat. You ever seen a moth attracted to your light bulb outside? Claude, you got to help me with this. I need country boy. Help me with this. Um, the understanding about moths is that they use what sailors used to use for many years. It's called transverse orientation. What that means is they travel by the light from the moon. Now, during the day, Malls sleep and rest, but at night they go out hunting for mates and they go out looking for food. So at night a moth travels by the moonlight. Now, now scientists say that transverse orientation is that the moth travels at a certain angle to the light of the moon and it keeps its body in flight based on a certain distance from the light of the moon. And so as long as it keeps the moonlight on its horizon and it keeps the right distance from the moon, it's able to fly in a straight line. When you see a moth outside on your porch, that's circling the light outside on the porch, it has mistaken your porch light for the light of the moon. But see, the porch light always its light is not consistent what happens is it flies towards it but because of transverse orientation the light never dims nor gets brighter so it loses its orientation see when it's looking at the moon as long as it keeps the right distance to the moon it knows how to fly straight but but when it when it fixes itself on your porch light its orientation is thrown off because now the ratio between where the light's coming from and the moth is distorted. So typically moths fly around in circles around that flame or that light bulb. And that's because their orientation is off. 
And when your orientation is off, you never get to where it is you're supposed to go. Preacher, what you're trying to tell me, what I'm trying to tell you is you got to be like the moth and look for the light that's in the sky. If you're looking for the light bulb, you're going to be flying around in circles, not ever going anywhere, always tripping on the same thing, always flying around until you get so tired, you just drop to the ground. Somebody here. Somebody here need to reorient themselves to the light. The scriptures teach us, Jesus said in John chapter 8 and verse number 12, I am the light of the world. Y'all realize that Jesus is the light? You need to come to him. Now, I haven't seen any facial expression. I don't know who out there looking at me with their arms folded. I don't know who then got up and walked out. I got no clue. So I'm going to be honest with you. I don't know how well this message is received based on body language. But I'm going to ask you this. You might not have liked my presentation. You may not appreciate my style. But I want you to focus on the word of God. My question to you is if you're in where you're going and piling into other people, you need to look for the light. You need to right now orientate yourself to the son of the living God. His name is Jesus Christ of Nazareth. If you hear him walking in darkness because you don't know God and Jesus is not in your life, you need to come to him by faith. The scriptures teach us he hung and bled on the cross of Calvary for sinners like you and me. That they took him down off the cross and put him in the grave. And early Sunday morning he rose from the grave. That empty grave proves that our Savior lives. You come to him by faith. Hearing and repenting of your sin. Being willing to confess with your mouth that he's the Christ, the son of the living God. We bury you. You come up a new creature walking in the light. If you're here, you're already a member. And maybe you're not growing. Maybe you haven't moved. Maybe, just maybe, your eyesight spiritually has been deteriorating. We beg you with all that we have to get that straight. Can you get it straight this morning? Somebody need to come to the Lord. Can we stand to our feet? Brother Barry, I want you to come and lead the song. Will you come to the Lord this morning? We beg you to come. No.